Father, we just thank you and praise you for your work. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that, uh, that you are with us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. You are a good and faithful God and you came. And all we need is in your hands. So Lord, we just ask, Heavenly Father, that you would fill us now with your spirit. We ask for more of you. We ask for more of your grace, more of your power, and the authority of your holy word. We need you. Fill us up. Adonai, Sifai, Ufi, Yagi, Kilatecha. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth. We'll call forth your praise. B'Shem Yeshu. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. How are you? Great. Great. At least one person is great. Are you all great? Well, God is great, and he makes our days greater than we can imagine. Amen and amen. If you were with us last week, we were continuing our study from the book of Nehemiah. I had done an introductory message, and then there's 12 messages that follows. And today, we are looking intently at the call that God has for us. Last week, hmm, my notes are not coming up. Oh, there they are. <laughs> Amen. Last week, we studied and we looked at our calling to community, didn't we? We looked at our calling to be in community, to live in community. We were reminded of the life of those like Dietrich Bonhoeffer who live this reality. Now, as you remember, what we've been studying is the book of Nehemiah. It's interesting that the meaning of his word was he was just a short little guy, a short little man. People could say, oh, what could he do? But yet, yet God used him in ways that still amaze us even now. And I really believe that beyond the initial prophecy and fulfillment, there's real prophetic, there's a real prophetic nature in the book of Nehemiah. And that's why I believe that the Holy Spirit gave me Nehemiah and the restoring of our age-old foundations as literally the foundation of our calling as a Messianic community and what we're called to do, how we're called to be, what our vision and direction is. And as I studied and I combined it with what we know from our 12 pillars of Tikkun, I saw how each of the 12 pillars match perfectly with the book of Nehemiah. Match perfectly. So last week we studied Nehemiah as our example. As I said, a simple man used of God in a decisive hour to bring unity, restoration, and deliverance to the children of Israel. Certainly we all need examples in our life of righteous men and women who point the way. And God does give that. And then we see a glimpse of Nehemiah with the people. He had a single calling. He had a single vision. He had a single understanding. And they all surrounded him. They surrounded God in him. And they embraced the reality of the kingdom of God that God had for them in that moment. And at the beginning of the book, we see Sambala everywhere, don't we? Cursing God's people. But at the end of the text, he's gone. As we looked last week also at Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. The early Messianic believers, they continued faithfully in the teaching of the emissary, the apostles, teachings and fellowship, breaking and bread and in prayers. And everyone was filled with awe and many miracles and signs, that's what we're talking about today, took place through the emissaries, through the apostles. And all of those trusting in Yeshua stayed together and had everything in common. God built community with these people. But it wasn't because they had an intentional community. We have that all throughout the world, don't we? These intentional communities. I, I'm really encouraged by a lot of these intentional communities, mostly amongst millennials. But they say, you know what? We're, we're not going to settle for status quo. We need something different. And they live a certain way. They hold one another accountable. They want to know how to live in a healthy way. And that's all well and good. But when you have that in the context of the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you, well, one, it's not for just one age group. It's for all of us. We're called to live 
in that type of community. And we see this in this text. They continued faithfully in singleness of purpose. What? To meet in the temple courts daily, to break bread and meet in each other's homes. And they shared their few food in joy and simplicity of heart, praising God and having the respect of all the people. And day after day, the Lord kept adding to them those who were being saved. Signs and wonders followed those that believed. Yes. And that's where we come to today with our message. That the kingdom of God is expressed not just in community, but in power. In the power of the Holy Spirit. We can do nothing apart from the spirit of the living God. Amen. I could put together a great plan like I was just saying. And those things should not be snubbed. Everything that's whole and beautiful and good and life-giving is from the Lord. Even some secular things. Because God wants to restore all of society. But we need to be called to something more than good. We need to be called to the great and to the best. And that is what God's Word gives us. The power of the Spirit gives us the ability to be His witnesses. To be anointed. We saw this with the reading from about Lazarus today, didn't we? It wasn't just a nice little tale, a nice little story. They got together and said, shit, because his dear brother died. No, he was risen from the dead. And the whole community knew not only that God lived, but this was the Messiah, the Holy One of Israel. Right. And a village was transformed. And through that story, countless thousands and millions have been transformed too. So today we see that the kingdom of God is expressed in power. I believe that this really resonates. If you have your Bibles, turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 19 to 21. Just want to very, read a very brief text here. And I'm taking it a little bit out of context, but I'm going to explain before and after, okay? Mostly the text before. And it says here, still you, this is a prayer, a statement of praise to God. This is what the children of Israel, the temple has been rebuilt, the walls have been rebuilt. There's holiness in the land. People have been brought back to God. It says, still you, Hashem, in your great compassion, did not abandon them, the children of Israel in the desert. The column of cloud did not leave them by day. It kept leading them along the way. By night, the column of fire kept showing their light and the path to take. I find that very interesting, the path to take. You also gave your good spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh, your Holy Spirit, to teach them. You did not withhold manna from their mouths and provided them water to quench their thirst. Yes. For 40 years you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell up. Wow. Can you imagine having a garment or a pair of shoes that lasts for 40 years? I want to tell you a funny little story. A couple of years ago, a man is going to laugh at this, so is Robinson probably. A couple of years ago, a man who worked at a shoe store. And I need a new pair of shoes, or I need a new pair of shoes. Why don't you come over? I've got my employee discount. So I got these little loafers, right? And I thought when I bought them, boy, babe, why am I buying these? They are so expensive, even with the discount. But what happened was they became my favorite pair of shoes. Oh, goodness. My feet are in heaven every time I put them on. And I've worn them to death. I mean, they're falling apart. On my feet. I've had them like not even two years. And I told Robinson the other day, I'm going to wear these shoes until they fall off my feet. <laughs> but here in this text, do we have this situation? No. They had shoes that were, as they say, brand spanking new after 40 years. And now because somehow they were made better, it's because God didn't allow it to wear out. God kept his covenant. But I think what stands out even more is the context of our passage. Nehemiah 9, beginning in verses 1 through 5, 
What do we see with the children of Israel? Those there that rebuilt the walls. This text marks a solemn convocation for Israel. It says on the 24th of the month, as they gather before Adonai in holiness and repentance for the purpose of what? They were separating themselves from the nations. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be like the world anymore. It's one thing to do a religious act and build a wall and to, to secure Jerusalem, but God wanted their hearts, not just their hammers, not just their sobs. He wanted their hearts. Amen. Put away your foreign gods, he was saying. Put away your pagan foreign wives who are leading you into idolatry. According to Rashi, this passage links directly to Ezra 10 for this very purpose, where Israel put away their foreign wives and with it the compromise that came with the worship of false gods. And from this place, what happens to Israel? In this place of solemn repentance, they erupt in praise, like we studied last week. And although verses 16 through 18 and all the way to verse 25 notes that in the wilderness wanderings, we were still stiff-necked. We ignored the commandments of Hashem and we even worshipped the golden calf. Still, in her teshuva, Israel is now embracing this overwhelming praise because they know that they know that they know that despite their failures of the past, that God in His Holy Spirit has never left them. He never left them. He never abandoned them. That their needs were met every moment of every day. It's interesting, the word manna means, what is it? Right? But it satisfied them and it took care of them. That was even water out of a rock. Everything they needed, they had in abundance. And I'm sure the nations around them in the wilderness marveled, who is their God that takes care of them so well? We are industrious and have more shackles, more money than we could ever use, and yet we struggle with this wandering people in the wilderness. They have everything they need and more. It was because God was faithful. It's because God is a covenant keeping God who keeps his promises to his people. And he keeps his promises to us, Behalo. He keeps his promises to us. See, this is important because as Israel is now coming to God in repentance, they were assured that he would fill them up to overflowing by his spirit, I believe. Because Adam and I was faithful, as I said, a covenant keeping God. And this gives us hope. Let's look at this text, I think, a little more intently. I think it's going to be of some encouragement to you. The first part of verse 19. Still, you in your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the desert. What does that tell us? I believe that it states that in God's compassion, no matter what our past is, no matter what mistakes we've made, no matter how many failings we've had, even if it was five minutes ago, if we repent, we are assured that we are not bound to our circumstances. Right, amen. That in His love, He will never leave you, and He will never forsake you. Yes, amen. Never. Yeah, but what if I blew it really bad, Rabbi? What part of never don't we get? If we are in Messiah and we mess up but we repent, He restores us fully yes. and completely. Yes. It is not your reputation that is on the line, it is His. That's right. Because He's faithful and true. Amen. Next, continuing in verse 19. What do we see? The column of cloud did not leave, leave the children of Israel by day. It kept leading them along the way. Everywhere they went, that's what that means. By night, the column of fire kept showing them the light, the Shekinah of God, and the path to take. See, this, what this reminds us is that in His compassion, God has promised to manifest His presence in your midst. Amen. Our faith is not just a faith that is just nice on a book, but there's no application. When God shows up, He shows up in authority 
and power. Can you imagine being Moses standing before the burning bush? Moses, take off your shoes. The ground to which you stand is holy. He was, his knees were probably knocking so hard against each other, he probably needed chiropractic care afterwards. <laughs> he knew how holy God was. Yes. And he saw the manifestation of his power and his grace. Yes. Verse 20. You gave your good spirit. I love that. His Holy Spirit is so good, isn't it? It is so good. He is so good. To teach them. You did not withhold manna for their mouths and provided water to quench their thirst. Everything they needed, they got. In faithfulness, God gave Israel his Ruach and a Messiah Yeshua, beloved. We are promised the outpouring and the impartation of the Spirit of the living God with power Amen. and abundance. We're going to be talking about this a little bit later on, but you know one thing I cannot, I cannot wrap my head around. Is that believers who think that they can do the call, fulfill the call to be part of the send, to be sent and used in power and authority without the Holy Spirit and His gifts. Many call the gifts of the Holy Spirit power tools. The other night, Reverend C. Cat and I were watching a, um, a Christian movie of mine. Who's seen uh, the second movie of God's Not Dead? Okay, powerful movie. And there's a scene in the, in the movie where the pastor's brother notices that his brother, the pastor, he has a tree in his backyard that's dead and needs to be cut down. Right? And he goes out and he hears this pounding in his backyard. He sees his brother chopping away at this tree. With a little axe, this big tree, semi-petrified, dead and huge. And I'm sitting there, I'm watching it. Boy, that's going to take me all day. And he's doing it without gloves. Ouch. Luckily, within three minutes, you see him with a chainsaw. Are we going to use little chisels? The spiritual chisels, maybe a toothpick with a sharp, jaded edge? Or do you want to use the power tools? The power tools. Hashem is giving you inside the show. It doesn't take rocket science to know here what, what was the best choice. The best tool being given for you to use. Continuing verse 21. For 40 years you sustained them in the desert. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out. And their feet did not swell. Because God's spirit and his faithfulness is in our lives every day. We, Beit Hillel, everyone, all of us have everything we need for the sake of the kingdom and to fulfill the calling of God in our lives. Yet as I said a moment ago, despite this abundance that's so available, so available to so many, to all of us in Messiah Yeshua, it's sad that so many churches, even denominations, completely cut the Holy Spirit out of their theology yeah. and their practice. Yeah. I really believe that it is a crisis in the body of Messiah. As I was preparing for my message, I was seeking the Lord and I said, God, give me an analogy, something that really expresses the seriousness of the hour in which we live and how we need the Ruach so seriously, so deeply. I remember years ago reading a book by one of my first mentors, first man that, dis man that discipled me, John Wimber. And, uh, Blessed memories with the Lord now. And when he wrote his book, Power Evangelism, How to Reach People in the Power of the Holy Spirit, he tells the story. This was after he had seen the outpouring of God in his congregation and witnessing to people. And he exults, he says, it really works. I thought as I wended, wended my way toward home, he was driving. And God used me as a vehicle of his healing mercy. Then I was jolted out of my jubilant mood by an incredible vision. Suddenly in my mind's eye, there appeared to be a cloud bank superimposed across the sky. But I had never seen a cloud bank like this one before. So I pulled my car over to the side of the road to, lay, to take a closer look. Then I realized it was not a cloud bank. It was a honeycomb with honey dripping out 
like the people below. The people were in a variety of postures. Some were reverent. They were weeping and holding their hands out to catch the honey, to taste it, even inviting others to take some of their honey as well. Others, however, acted irritated, wiping the honey off themselves, complaining about this mess. I was awestruck. Awesome. Not knowing what to think, I prayed, Lord, what is it? What does it mean? And he says, this honey, it's my mercy, John. Some people, for some people, it's a blessing. But for others, it's a hindrance. There's plenty for everyone. Don't ever beg for my healing again. The problem isn't on my end, John. The problem is down there. It's on yours. See, God has given us everything we need in abundance. But yet, we refuse to operate and use and walk out in the calling that Hashem has given us for these last days. We can't do that any longer. We need to be filled with God's Spirit. We need to be anointed and called out for this great hour. Now, as we examine this problem, we're reminded in the book of Acts, when the festival of Shavuot arrived, Acts chapter 2, and the believers all gathered together in one place, suddenly there came a sound from the sky, like the roar of a violent wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw and looked like tongues of fire, which separated and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. The promised Holy Spirit, we see it in Joel, and we see it fulfilled here with the Feast of Shavuot. It isn't something we just do during the feast days. God wants to fill us up with His fire, and with His holiness, and with His gifts. And as the honey of God's Spirit drips down upon us, what is our response going to be? Is it going to be disgust? Ooh, this is messy. Take this off of me. Or is it going to be, God, I want more. And running to everyone around you, taste this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes, amen. What is our response going to be? But yet, as I said, there's so many in the body that don't want any of this. And I don't think I've heard, I've read books about it after books about it after books about it. It's not just bad theology, beloved. I believe, and this is a hard word, but I want you to receive it. I don't think it's a hard word for you because we're all kind of, I'm kind of preaching at the choir around this topic, but, but maybe for some it might be. People we minister to. I don't think it's bad theology as much as I believe that it is the embrace of the zeitgeist. That's a German word meaning the spirit of the age. We have embraced in the body of Messiah the spirit of the age instead of the spirit of Messiah. We want to look politically correct more than we want to be holy. We want to be cool more than we want to be set apart. And I believe that the root of this problem is demonic in origin because what it really is, is a spirit of control. It's a spirit of control in our lives and an unwillingness in our hearts to be completely molded into the image of Yeshua. I remember years ago, Robinson Cat and I used to go to both a Messianic congregation and actually a charismatic Episcopal church. And the pastor of the church, Father Mike Flynn, wrote a book called Holy Vulnerability, and God was dealing with his heart, too, an Anglican. And he says, he was walking to the service one Sunday morning, he goes, give me the service or I'll remove you from ministry. He goes, what do you want me to do? Yeah, just let me be God. And if you don't, I'm removing you. And he goes, I don't want to do that. He says, well, then you won't live to see your next birthday. He said, okay, God, take it. And the Spirit of God poured out on that church. 
And they were a witness to the entire Episcopal Church around the country. And it's because of congregations like that that the charismatic Anglican movement today exists. Because they said we want the power and the presence and the spirit of God more than we want man-made religion. And God moved. Because they surrendered their hearts. We must break free from this falsehood that exists in the body of Messiah, the body of Christ, that says, speaks the lie that Jesus and the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. No, he isn't. No, he isn't. And it doesn't bother him to rattle your world a little bit, to make you uncomfortable, to even make things look unseemly in the moment, if it means that the manifestation of the power and presence of his kingdom is in your midst. Well, we don't do things that way. We're, we're, we're missing him. I remember talking to Father Mike years ago. We're Anglican. We have to be prim and proper, he used to say. And he goes, hogwash. I don't want to be prim and proper. I want to be filled with God Amen. to overflow him. And you know what? If it gets people shocked and waked up a little bit, maybe that's a good thing. It doesn't mean that we throw out the Bible and we forget that the Word of God says that all things that must be done decently and in order. But if we're constantly putting God and the Holy Spirit in the box, guess what? The Holy Spirit's not going to move here. He's going to go half a mile down the street to the other congregation and pour it out there. That's right. Amen. I don't want to be looking from the outside in. I want to experience. I want to know the reality of all that God has for us yes. as a congregation. This, I believe, correlates with what, as we've been talking about, our dear friend here in Chikun, Eitan Shishkov, when he talks about us being called to be holy revolutionaries. Our calling is to go against the tide, to break free from the humanistic deceptions of our culture, our godless secular culture. We are not called to be molded into the image of the zygotes, of the spirit of the age, but instead to bring redemption to those that are lost through signs and wonders and the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And to join into what is called by many the divine human dance of cooperation with the Holy Spirit. A few weeks back I was watching this movie and it's funny because it correlated with what I'm about to read in a moment. There was, it was in the Old West, and there was a man who had made a puppet, a mannequin, and he tied it to his shoes, and he tied it to his hands, and they were having this campfire hoedown dancing, and he was dancing with this mannequin. And it looked silly. But the reality is, if we're going to be used by God, we need to learn how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. To listen to Him, and let Him lead, not the other way around. We need to be sensitive enough to the Holy Spirit in this holy dance that God has called us into. See, that takes time. It takes getting into His Word. It gets to, it becomes only with knowing His heart. See, the answer is that we must embrace humility, we must embrace holy vulnerability. And we must allow the Ruach to lead us, especially now, more than ever. And in this, our, our anticipation and our expectation comes through. It's what many in the body call a Kairos moment. Who has ever heard that term? A Kairos moment. Kairos meaning the outpouring of God's Spirit, where the unplanned, mo uh, unplanned moments of invitation, impartation, and release of God's Spirit happens in His body. You can't plan for it. You just have to be open to it. You have to be receptive to what He's saying in the moment. Will we become part of that holy dance? I know I'm reading a lot of things here, but I think it's important. There's elements of my teaching today that is really more teaching and some reading of quotes, but I think it's important. Our dear friend here at Beit Hillel, Dr. Brad Long from PRMI, Presbyterian Reform Ministries International, that we are in partnership with, and he and his ministry are part of Tikkun. He writes in his book, 
growing your church in the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, when I, Brad, was a guest speaker at an Anglican church in the bush of Uganda, I saw how the dynamic cooperation with the Holy Spirit is to be in the growing of the body. Perhaps it was because of the lack of humility built structures made it easy to see clearly the work of humanly built structures made it easy to see clearly the work of God. The mud bricks were half completed when the money ran out. Banana leaves tied the pole to the poles kept the tropical sun from burning the heads of those unless the rains came. People crammed together into a building and slipped out around the edges. A ragged group of men and mostly women in their Sunday best. A good number of unwashed children in rags, mostly AIDS orphans, hovered around the edges. The priest, Keslan Samanda, a godly man with, who had pastored pastoral charge to this and several other congregations was on fire with the love of Yeshua, the love of Jesus, for these poor people. As I looked over the crowd, I found a similar love welling up from deep within me too, coming right from the heart of Yeshua. I was overwhelmed, feeling a weight for my souls, for, from their souls, as well as for their deepest physical condition. This love for a people and the Lord is what sets the context for the dance. The service, while traditional in format, was bursting with joy and power. Great joy and enthusiasm abounded as people declared in the Buddhist language, the Buddhist tongue, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Former Anglicans and Catholics know that prayer, right? I mean, um, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we praise and glorify your holy name. These were heartfelt confessions of deep, vital faith in Yeshua the Messiah. Through Keslan's ministry, I sense the powerful presence of Yeshua speaking and ministering to the people. The Holy Spirit was welcomed there, and the priest himself was anointed with the Spirit for that dance of cooperation within a traditional Anglican liturgy. While Keslan translated, I preached about the love of Jesus, the love of Jesus, and how he truly is the way to salvation. Unexpectedly, an image flashed into my mind of the places and the floors of that mud brick hut that had been made empty by children and parents who had died. I knew that I was being invited into the dance of cooperation, that this was a Kairos moment in which the Spirit was preparing to work, but I hesitated on the edge of the dance floor, struggling with my own inability and feelings of unworthiness. Don't we struggle with that sometimes? I know I do. I was well-clothed, wealthy, and healthy from America. What can I possibly say that would have meaning in the context of these people's deepest poverty? In truth, there was nothing I could say, but Yeshua had a lot to say. And he wanted to say it through me. The image persisted, and I asked, Lord, is this from you? See, this is cooperating with the Holy Spirit. He said, speak it, and let me work. As a step of obedient faith, I said that I thought Yeshua, Jesus, wanted to tell us something. Tesla immediate response was, of course, Jesus wants to speak to us. He is here. What does he want us to say? So I described the image I had seen, and Tesla had heard, had hardly finished translating before there arose wailing from the group. As the Holy Spirit fell upon the people in power and in love, for several hours, Yeshua worked in the midst as prophet speaking words of life to the people, as king calling them to follow him, and as priest offering healing for their hurts. See, this is what happens when we choose to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, when we enter into this holy dance that he alone leads. 
It's interesting when we look at our text in Acts chapter 2. One Messianic commentary, Stephen Gare says, Luke's, Luke's description of these manifestations, the manifestations we see, resemble the description of Adonai's shining out glory manifest at Mount Sinai in Exodus 19.18, and the filling of the temple upon its dedication in 2 Chronicles 5.14. The Ruach HaKodesh was once again gloriously revealing himself in the midst of Israel. Such as Philo, the first century Jewish historian says, it describes, its description is seen in the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai, emphasizing both the fire of God and the language of God in communicating his will to his people Israel. So what is God's will for us? It's the same as with that of ancient Israel. That we would walk in the power and might of God's Spirit. What do we see in Matthew 29, 18 and 19? Yeshua came and talked to them and he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, make people from every nation into Talmudim, immersing them into the reality of the Father, Yeshua the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh. This perfectly matches with what once John Wimber spoke to me and discipling me. And he says, because the Spirit of God is in us, Mark, he says, all authority is in Messiah. So anything he commands us to do, guess what? We have access to the power that requires us to do it and to fulfill it. Yes, absolutely. You don't have to be on the sidelines watching. And we're certainly not called to say, oh, that's just for the Pentecostals and the Charismatics or whatever. By the way, we are a fivefold ministry congregation. That's what it means. We walk out that reality. We don't sit on the sidelines and say, that's not for us. It's for God's whole body. That we would be infused with the spirit of the living God for kingdom work. It shall grow. The early Messianic community received the spirit to one Preach the good news to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and then to every nation. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power. Beit Hillel, you will receive power when the Ruach comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Yerushalayim, in Yehuda, in Shalom, indeed to the ends of the earth. See, it doesn't happen because we have a better plan, a better program. And, oh, aren't we glad and proud of ourselves. Pat ourselves on the back for our campaign, Ignite Ocala 2019. Without the spirit of the living God, it means nothing. It's just a web page on a website of a congregation that nobody should read. But when the spirit comes, Amen. when the power of God comes, that's when life is breathed into it. Because the life of God is breathed into us. And then we can go in his name. Go, ye therefore. Go and preach the good news. We see this also in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Which what I believe is the impartation that God has for each and every one of us of Yeshua as prophet, priest, and king. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. Brothers, Rob Shaul says, When I arrived among you, it was not for surpassing eloquence or wisdom that I came announcing to you the previously concealed truth about God. For I had decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything except Yeshua the Messiah, and even him only as someone who had been executed on a stake as a criminal. Also, I myself was with you as somebody weak, nervous, and shaking all over with fear. And neither the delivery nor the content of my message relied on compelling words or wisdom. Can you imagine? This is Rob Shaul. He was probably one of the most brilliant rabbis of the day. And this is what he's saying about himself. He didn't rely on human strength, on words of wisdom, but on the demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God so that you may tr your trust might rest not on human wisdom, but on God's power. See, the Holy Spirit is a part of it. The Holy Spirit is all of it. We are called to go forth in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to preach the good news, to share life to those that are dying and perishing. If we are to receive God's anointing and impartation, we must first seek our own healing, though. 
We must seek our first, our own restoration. We cannot give to the world what we do not have. And below it, you cannot go where you're not, you cannot leave where you're not willing to go. The world will see right through it and they'll just say, phony baloney, don't want what they have. They're just a bunch of kooks. Because at that point, we might be. But if we're filled with God's Spirit, prophetically anointing us to fulfill the call, then the nations will come. That our city will be restored and healed. People around the nation will say, yes, did you see what's happening in little old Ocala? A city transformed for the kingdom of God. And how do we do it? By making Israel first. To the Jew first and then to every nation. By surrendering ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit. We must receive the impartation of Yeshua into our lives, as I mentioned before from Brad Long's quote, as prophet, priest, and king. By the power of the Holy Spirit, it is Yeshua, our prophet, who prophetically speaks words of life to us, his people. By the power of the Holy Spirit, it is Yeshua who is our priest, after the order of Mel Melchizedek, who is our mediator and offers through his precious blood healing for our hurts and deliverance from our brokenness. And it is by the power of the Holy Spirit alone that Yeshua is our Melech, our King, who is sovereign over us and calls us to follow Him in holiness and in truth. Amen. See, as I conclude, this perfectly aligns with our calling. We are called to surrender to Him, to His healing, to His wholeness, to His anointing, so that we can be His witnesses. You know, as your rabbi, I know most of you very, very well, even intimately, and I know with a number of you that the people you're with during the week, the job you hold, I watch you and I see the gifts of the Holy Spirit in you. And I know how God wants to use you, is using you, and has so much more for you. You know, if we rely just on somebody to hopefully trickle in here on Shabbat morning, We'd miss it, wouldn't we? Because what can I, just one man, do? But we're a body. Amen. We're a community. And as a community, we've all been anointed with gifts and anointings and callings. And God wants to fill us up to overflowing with His Holy Spirit. I could just line you up all right now and say, Yeah, I remember you work with these people, you do this and that during the day. You have a large business in the community, a place of prominence, people come to you. Wow. You shall be my witnesses in power and in anointing. See, this is why you are here. This is why God gave you life, so that you could speak life to a broken world. So in the end, in God's compassion, no matter what our past is, this is the message that comes through the power of the Holy Spirit first to us and then to all the nations of the world. That in God's compassion, no matter what our past is, or that of our circumstances, in love, He will never leave or forsake you. In His compassion, God has promised to manifest His power and presence in and through you. He has promised. Is God, is a, is God a man that He would lie? No. He promised it and He will fulfill it. In faithfulness, God gave Israel his spirit. But how much more for you in Messiah Yeshua, who has been promised an outpouring and an impartation of signs and wonders and gifts, and that in abundance. And finally, because God's spirit is in us, and he is faithful to us every day. We have everything we need in abundance. We have everything we could ever ask for or think. And we are called for the sake of the kingdom to go. Will you go? Will you be salt and light to a hungry and dying world? And will you be filled with God's Spirit? Let's embrace our own healing, beloved, our own wholeness, our own restoration, and let's declare it to a broken world. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Father, we just thank you and praise you. We thank you for the presence and the power of your Spirit. I pray, God, that you will just fill up your people today to overflow. 
that you would reveal to us all the more, Lord God, that there is nothing we can do without your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we just say goodbye today to a religion, to a faith, to a falsehood that says that we can do it in our own strength, that we can do it without the Holy Spirit, that we can do it with our own little plans and schemes and even good intentions. We leave that all at your feet today. And we just ask God that you would just fill us up. That you would just fill us up to overflow so that we could truly be your witnesses. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Please stand and let us finish your worship. Let us open ourselves up to Him and ask Him to come and inhabit our being. All of Him and none of us. Let your faith be renewed. 